today we are here with three medical professionals. I will introduce my guests. We have Dr. Sarah Lynn Walters, which is the medical director of ambulatory services for a regional One Health and heads their post-COVID clinic in conjunction with the university. As well as we have Dr. Kedrick Pickering, which is, we all know, OBGYN at the Pick Smith Medical. And we have Dr. Charlene Lewis, which is a general practitioner and runs the Wellness Center Medical, the Wellness Center Medical Clinic. I just want to say good night. How is everyone doing tonight? Doing as well as possible. As well as possible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you for joining us. And of course, Leader of the Opposition also wants to thank you for just giving your time. Of course, in this climate, I'm sure all three of you have much to do, but found it necessary to join us here today to give the relevant information and to educate the general public on what is going on. Now, we're going to jump right into it. And I want to start with just a general question as to, and this is really opinionated, I want persons to understand that, but with all that we're going through right here in the BVI, what would be your assessment of our country's situation right now as it pertains to COVID-19? Anyone can start. I think our situation um, is a perfect example of what Professor Cummings um, alluded to in terms of the running out of our luck. We had done pretty well in terms of avoiding the onslaught of COVID-19 for the better part of, what, 16 to 18 months, six, about 16 months. And um, we, we definitely did slacken up a lot. And, you know, things had to start changing. We couldn't keep living in a bubble. And, you know, a lot of factors happened and our luck, I think, really ran out. Okay. Anyone else? I think I, I would say it's the inevitable. Um, you really were um, living kind of in a, a um, false bubble because of the things that were done previously. And so what has happened recently is just the taste of what has been going on in the bigger um, countries and in the nations overall that we've basically been dealing with for the last year or so. Understood. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So we're gonna move on to, and we're gonna jump right into it because right now, the big topic is vaccination, the COVID-19 vaccination specifically. And it, it, it's a touchy subject when it comes to some persons, but we have to talk about it, okay? And I think the more information we can get out there, the better. And we're gonna just start off with the basics. What is a vaccine? I'm gonna I'm gonna start I'm gonna start picking persons just like the teacher. So we're gonna start with Dr. Lewis. Okay, so a vaccine um, is actually a technology that we've used for decades now, where we are able to introduce a small, non-harmful part of or you know um, sort of version of an infection that we're trying to prevent. For the most part, it really does center around viral in, um, infections as opposed to other infections. And one of the reasons with, for that is that with viral infections, the real thing that helps your body to fight an, a viral infection is actually your body's immune response and the, the speed with which your body is able to have certain immune responses to a virus because we know that no medications necessarily kill viruses. They are very small particles. They have very um, they have mechanisms that help them to escape a lot of you know the regular immune system sort of. So, uh, um, antibiotic. You can use medication that may help to slow down the the speed with which a virus is able to you know replicate or you know. Uh, 
grow itself within your own body, but it really is your body's response that helps that helps you to fight that infection. And what a vaccine does is rather than wage war with you know machine guns and bombs everywhere, a vaccine can actually help your body to have a more strategic and a quicker response to viruses when they come into your body. Okay. And there's several different ways that you can make a virus. Like I said, you can either have a piece of a particle of the virus. You can either have, um, you know, what we call a live attenuated. So it's live vaccine, but it, it can't make you sick. It can have a, a dead form of the virus that would still carry some of the information that your body would need to build a response. So there are different ways of um, being able to deliver that kind of information to your body. Okay. And I want you, you spoke specifically on what is a vaccine but and you spoke about mm -hmm. just those different components of what a vaccine is but which one exactly is the COVID-19 vaccine how does the COVID-19 vaccine work specifically AstraZeneca because we know we're dealing with different um, types and different brands and different you know mm -hmm. So we, I can talk about the AstraZeneca and Dr. Walters. I'll try and touch on the mRNA vaccines, but feel free to jump in because I know you're going to be more familiar with those um, practicing in the U.S. The AstraZeneca vaccine is actually what we call an, adeno, an adenovirus vector vaccine. It is one where the virus is, or the, the identifying factor of the virus is basically put on another type of virus that your body is more easily able to fight off without you know, a whole massive inflammatory response. But instead of that other virus that your body is able to kill so easily, you know, being dressed in its own clothes, it's going to be dressed in something that the coronavirus is going to wear. So let's say coronavirus likes to wear this particular type of outfit. Then the adenovirus vaccine that we have is another type of vaccine that's dressed in the outfit that coronavirus would wear. So when your body builds an immune response to the vaccine, in this, you know, outfit, when coronavirus now comes in wearing that same outfit, your body is going to be able to recognize it. Like, you know, hey, I saw this particle before and I know how to kill this. So I'm going to attack that. That black and white outfit is not something I want to see around here. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to kill everybody who's wearing that black and white outfit, basically. Um, but I know with the mRNA vaccines, it's not that it's not dressing somebody else up. It's not dressing up a dummy. Basically, it's just giving little pieces of information that we have been able to develop the technology to actually get into your body's cells, especially your immune cells, to be able to build up that um, number of jump, you know, jumpsuits or you know, outfits that coronavirus would wear. So again, the coronavirus is, is going to come in dressed in a certain outfit and your body is going to be able to recognize it because it's seen that foreign particle before. So they both sort of work on help on um, by identifying the coronavirus, but in it's come up, it comes about in various ways. Um, so those are the basic the, the two more common types of coronavirus vaccines that we have. There are others that have been developed by Russia, by China, by Cuba, um, but those really aren't that much available. There isn't that much of um, information available, and then they're really not that available on the markets. So right. I tend to talk about the AstraZeneca, what we have available, and COVAX, which is another one that's available in lots of Caribbean islands. And then they have the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, which are available in the U.S. Okay. Anybody else want to jump in? Did I miss anything, Dr. Will, Dr. Walters? No, that was, that was okay. great. Uh <laughs> okay. okay. So we know that, of course, persons are... They're not medical professionals. They're still figuring it out. Um, much persons are concerned with, are we putting the virus into our bodies when getting this vaccine? Do we, are we giving ourselves COVID, so to say? And I know you explained, you know, the, the outfit, but just to break it down just a little bit more for persons, are we, you know, are persons, just for the persons who don't know, are you putting the actual virus into your body when you take the vaccine? Not with these vaccines that we have available. But there are other vaccines where you actually put a, a, the virus itself that may be a little bit made to be not harmful. So I don't know if anybody remembers that movie. Um, oh my gosh, the one Hannibal Lecter, 
where he was basically locked up. There are other virus, other vaccines where you would basically be putting the virus into the person, but this is not the technology in these vaccines that we have available. You're not putting coronavirus in, you're putting the information that helps you to identify coronavirus so that your body can build up a better response, a quicker response than um, if you were to get infected with coronavirus. Okay, thank you for that. Now, anyone else, thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. So persons are asking, what is the difference between the AstraZeneca, the Bonderna, the Pfizer? And you did explain just now briefly the technology that is used and the metal that is used within the vaccine. So of course, that is the vast difference. But persons are just asking, is one better than the next? So I, I can jump in and talk about this. I wouldn't necessarily say any one of these vaccines are the other. And I always tell people it's kind of like um, tennis shoes. One is Nike, one is Adidas, one is Puma. They're all shoes. They're all tennis shoes. You're going to have people who say, well, Nike is better than Puma. Um, Nike, Adidas is better than this but they're all doing the same thing. They're doing it in a slightly different way. The whole goal of any vaccine is to introduce a part of the virus before you actually have to be, before the virus actually sees you. And so it's a uh, concentrated, like, like um, Dr. Lewis says, it is a strategic move on trying to get your body to see something that's not going to make you sick before you actually have to be introduced to something that could make you sick and kill you. And so the, the three different ways that they do it is, you know, AstraZeneca uses that adenoviral vector. So it uses that little vehicle to have that protein, which resembles coronavirus. The mRNA just says, hey, we're going to let your body make the protein. So we send in that message, like a ticket to the to the um, chef at a restaurant. We send in that message. Your cell is like the cook. It makes that protein, and then your body responds to it. And then some of the other vaccines, they just have the protein, and they just it, um, it goes directly into the body. The effect is the same from all of them. It's just the method is a little different from each one of them. Okay. Okay. Good. So. <laughs> When I was growing up, I guess, I think when all of us was growing up, we got vaccines as babies and persons are saying, well, those vaccines back then probably worked because, you know, if we got the chicken pox vaccine, we didn't get chicken pox. If we got some other vaccine, we didn't get whatever vaccine that was. So, so persons are saying, isn't a vaccine supposed to eradicate all together and how come they can still catch the virus if they take this vaccine and i, I can take that too <laughs> um so some of the infections that we got vaccines for it's not that the vaccine necessarily eradicated it is that the herd immunity and the level of vaccination eradicated that disease so say for instance, smallpox and measles. So measles were still going around, but there was such a major campaign in terms of vaccination that so many people got vaccinated that measles wasn't able to transfer or transmit to others. And so by essence, you did not get measles anymore. Um, we have seen in the last 10, 20, 30 years that you know people who are choosing not to have their kids vaccinated, those diseases are back. And so you will have measles and in, 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 uh, we haven't had smallpox, but some of these diseases from way back when popping up in little populations where people are not vaccinated anymore and it kind of goes through. So, but that is, that is those diseases that were by vaccination was very well eradicated. We have things like the flu shot. So the flu shot every year that we get does not stop you from getting the flu. It really is to prevent you from dying from the flu. And so, and it helps reduce the transmission. So, you know, if you're the person that's vaccinated from the flu and you got it, you have less virus, you have less symptoms, you're less likely to give it to someone else. And the flu shot every year that we get, especially for healthcare workers where I work, it's mandatory where we work because we have populations that are immunosuppressed that are sick 
And so we might do fine with the flu, but give it to some one of our patients and they might die from it. So even though those are mandatory, they're just 30 to 50% effective. Right. Because the, the flu strains change every year. And sometimes we're not always good at picking the right strain. So when you look at vaccines, this COVID vaccine with the type of viruses, the coronavirus, flu virus, influenza viruses, some of the other viruses are so hardy and they're so smart and they um, mutate so well that it is hard to find uh, a vaccine that will totally wipe them out even with a small percentage of people being vaccinated. So Understood. that's part of the difference. Understood. So now that we're on the, um, the topic of booster shots, so we were very early in the conversation, um, researchers and, you know, professionals were saying that you might have to get that booster shot for the COVID-19 vaccine. What is that? What, what does that look like? How long? Um, when, when does persons expect this to happen, etc.? So I think just like how they have different strains of the flu vaccine coming out every year, uh, we're definitely going to have to wait to get more information as we go along to see if we need booster shots for the coronavirus vaccines. I think I saw an article that came out in Medscape just today or yesterday that's saying that the Pfizer company has started to present some evidence that the vaccine protection may start to decrease after a certain amount of time. And they are pushing to have a third um, dose or a booster shot, a third dose later down. But, you know, we're, we're going to have to wait for the evidence of that. So far, the doses that we have been given um, have been shown a very good efficacy, meaning that they give very good protection, even against the variants that we see coming out. So recently, you know, Dr. George has said that we did not have the Delta variant here and I, I, and on one hand, I said, thank God, but on the other hand, it's scary because if that was not the Delta variant that we had here, variant, sorry, that we had here, and we had, we're now up to 31 deaths and we had over 2,000, over, I think it's 20, 2,200 persons that were infected by now. If that's what happened now, that was not the Delta vi um, variant. It, it's almost scary what could happen if, you know, those new variants coming out, which Delta variant is now so much more transmissible than even the original strain of coronavirus. I think I've, I've been hearing that it's a thousand times more transmissible. So it, initially they were saying that with coronavirus, you can infect up to three other people if you have the original strain of the coronavirus. So now imagine if it's a thousand times more um, transmissible. You're hearing about people who are picking up coronavirus in outdoor spaces in open air spaces. And, you know, that level of, of security or protection that we may have had being here where we have a lot of outdoor living, you know, that's going to be taken away. We're really and truly you're left with the options of becoming vaccinated or forever sort of have to wear a mask for forever and ever. And that is just because the, vi the virus in itself is going to try to survive. It is going to mutate. It's going to want to live. You know, it, it's as much as it's just a particle of genetic information floating around really and truly it can be very self-sufficient and self and self-serving it wants to live so it is going to change itself in ways that makes it be able to transmit to more people and also be able to live longer in your system to be able to fight whatever immune system response that you're having it is going to continue to change and that's the same thing that we saw with hiv why, which why HIV was so difficult to control even with um, antiviral medications early on because it was a it is a virus that also mutates very easily. So we have to be very mindful that so far what we're seeing with the vaccine is very good protection against not only the original strain but also against the variants. So all these things we have to keep in mind going forward. And then we also, like, you know, the early studies, especially with Pfizer and Moderna, they were showing that immunity would last for about one to two years because we have to recognize we just got the vaccines for the public in December, but these vaccines, they were testing from last year. So we've had people who've been vaccinated over a year ago. Yes. And so they're looking at these studies and showing that currently they're they're maintaining their immunity for at least a year, thinking that it would it would take two years. But like Dr. Lewis said, 
the the boosters are going to become more um, important or start even earlier when we start seeing having variants that are no longer as effective with the vaccine. At that point, we will need to have the, um, the vaccines um, adjusted just like we do the flu and try to come up with what strain of the flu make the vaccine as a result of that. If we're noticing that we're having those changes in the variants where it's not as effective, they would have to make boosters that are now effective for those new strains. Okay, thank you so much. Now, Dr. Pickren, You've been just listening on and we want to hear from you. You know, you are a prominent voice here in the BBI and the people really want to hear from you. So more questions on the vaccine. And we're here, we're hearing a lot of things really. But, you know, we spoke about the vaccine about a year ago, Dr. Walters, a year ago being administered. And one of the big things that persons are really talking about and worried about is how so fast like you know I don't know it's a little touchy where it's it's too fast what, what about the clinical trials why what about the trials and persons are skeptical about the timeline Dr. Pickering what do you have to say about that well, well I'm smiling because I almost forgot that I was a participant I was listening to my younger colleagues and just enjoying learning so much from them that I, I, I forgot I was here. But you know, that's, that's, um, that's an interesting question that I, I have to answer on a regular basis. And, you know, simply put, it, it's, it ties into what exactly, you know, Dr. Lois and Dr. Walters are saying that we live in a technological age and uh, you just have to remember that the corona, the COVID-19 is what is referred to as a coronavirus. It is a part and parcel, a group of viruses that exist already. You know, similar to the common cold, it's a group of viruses that are referred to as adenoviruses. So once you recognize initially what was causing the problems way back when, when this thing started in Wuhan, China, and the technology became available to identify the specific nature of the virus and then it was grouped. It was just a question of identifying the more, more detailed aspects of it. And once that was done, then you just, it's, it's like a, a that exists. You, you just start plugging in additional information to match the virus that you are now studying and start to, mm -hmm find ways in which to counteract the specific nature of this new virus, bearing in mind that it is only part of a family that already exists. It's just like all of us are members of a family. You look like your father, you look like your mother, et cetera, et cetera. And then there, the technology then evolves. So in terms of the, 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 the so-called speed by which the vaccine was developed, it's just technology that we're using in, in, in a technologically advanced world. And then in addition to that, don't underestimate what, you know, President Trump did with, with um, Operation Warp Speed when he made the money available that allowed the various laboratories around the world to, to really work night and day, to share the technology, to share specimens. And uh, so there was a great collaboration because resources were available and then by the time this thing became obvious and, and that it was a, a pandemic all resources were then put in place to go after it to try and find the best way to stop it in its tracks and that's why the vaccine was developed in the way in which it was developed for the betterment of us all because had it not developed like that can you imagine how many people would have died from this pandemic and because of the vaccine, we've been able to stem the tide to slow the progression. Mm -hmm. Never mind you're seeing a uh, resurgence of the virus right now, but it's just like what Dr. Lewis and Dr. Walls have been saying about the way the virus continues to change its nature to be able to adapt because it wants to survive. And just like how it wants to survive, we want to kill it. So we continue to put resources to, to try and kill it. And the, the, the number one 
resource that we have at our disposal is the vaccination to stop it in the tracks. And that's where we are at this point in time. Okay. Okay. But but um yeah, I was really enjoying my my two younger colleagues. Just um, they sound so bright. <laughs> <laughs> well, you haven't gotten away yet. So you know, persons are hearing the background, the medical information, and this is conversation that we've been having over and over and over again. And there are still some persons that are still a bit skeptical. So we want to speak a little bit about underlying factors persons would say i'm not getting the vaccine because of certain reasons for because of under i might have underlying factors so we're going to touch a little bit about that first thing we're going to speak about blood clot we there some research have come about that links the covid 19 vaccine with blood clots now persons who have suffered from blood clots are or are prone to suffering um, from blood clots, what would you say to those persons? Well, according to the NICE, the, the UK guidelines that I have seen about the AstraZeneca vaccine, you are to take some caution with persons who have a history of thrombosis. Um, this is not to say that it's completely contraindicated. It does say the, the guidelines do tell us that it depends on the person's risk. Now, if their risk of forming clots is very high, we'll be cautious in giving those persons the AstraZeneca or any adeno, adenovirus um, vector vaccine, which is also the Johnson & Johnson in the UK, in the US, I'm sorry. Um, so those two vaccines are very similar. And so with persons who have a history, especially a strong history, of having blood clots, you would tend to use a lot more caution with giving them the AstraZeneca or the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. But what we are hearing are persons who have other underlying conditions who are reluctant to take the vaccine. And those persons are diabetics, persons with hypertension, persons with um, lupus, with you know irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, persons with sickle cell disease, they're very hesitant to take the vaccine. And the bad thing about that is those are the persons who are more at risk. They're the persons who have underlying chronic inflammatory conditions. And so if coronavirus comes into their body, coronavirus just basically kicks into high gear, inflammation in your body. And for persons who don't have these conditions, it almost puts them in a state where they would have lupus. And if you ever knew, knew anybody who has lupus, they suffer from severe joint pains, from respiratory problems, they have kidney failure. And I mean, this is something that can be caused by the virus itself. So for persons who have those underlying conditions, they should be first in line to take the vaccine because they need that more strategic protection from patching and, for, and, from, and to deal with a coronavirus infection. Now, as we said before, it does not mean that you're not going to get coronavirus if you take the vaccine there still is going to be a small chance that you can still pick it up. But the beautiful thing about it is rather than your body throwing bombs everywhere and just destroying your body's um, you know, natural, normal function, your body is going to be able to have its general sitting down and you know, throw any snipers out into the environment where you have coronavirus and just picking it off a lot more strategically and just throwing bombs and spraying a machine gun everywhere. Okay. Okay. So big difference between your body being able to fight off the infection and then your body being able to um, have a more strategic response. I really like these metaphors. It's really breaking it down for us. <laughs> now, Dr. Pickering, last week you were on a forum and of course the conversation surrounding pregnancy and the COVID-19 vaccine, it's one that... It's, it's coming up very often because when the COVID-19 vaccine first came on the market, pregnant women could not take the COVID-19 vaccine as well as children. Now they're saying, go ahead, Co um, pregnant women can take the COVID-19 vaccine. Last week during a forum, you, you said that 
it would be safer for a pregnant woman to take the COVID-19 vaccine than to not to take it. So I want you to elaborate a little bit more on that, you know, explain that to us a little bit. Let me answer it by piggybacking on what Dr. Lewis was explaining, because it fits into the same principle. The whole concept of the vaccine and vaccination versus the risk of getting COVID and developing complications as a result of getting the disease is what we are really about. And what Dr. Lewis was explaining is that despite the fact that you may have, and this is all of us as physicians have to deal with this question every day. Doc, I have, I have diabetes, I have low blood pressure, should I, can I take the vaccine? I mean, patients come to us and say, I need to be checked to be sure I can take the vaccine. And uh, all of that is fine. The point that we want to stress more than anything else is that we have to look at the risks to the benefit Mm -hmm. the pros and the cons. We don't want anybody to take the vaccine purely because we say you should take it. We want you to understand that you're fighting a battle. And if you take the vaccine, yes, there are potential problems that could develop. But if you don't take the vaccine and you get COVID and you have underlying medical conditions, you are li likely to get really sick end up in hospital, end up in intensive care on a ventilator. And I think by now, hand to be there, we recognize that the death rate is extremely high for persons who become really sick with COVID. Right. So part of our responsibility is what we are trying to get our fellow human beings, our fellow citizens, our fellow brothers and sisters to understand is, but you don't have to get there, you know, because the vaccine can protect you from getting seriously ill with COVID. We understand that some people who vaccinate will get the, the virus. They may even have symptoms, but we are pretty sure at this stage that by taking the vaccine, it can prevent you from ending up in hospital on a ventilator. That's right. what we are trying to get people to understand. The specific question that you're asking about pregnancy, at this stage where we are, and the knowledge base that we have, the vaccine does not appear to have any effect on either a pregnant woman or her growing fetus. What we do know, and a lot of this work came out of China in the early stages, is that pregnant women who get COVID are in that high risk category for ending up in hospital. And by and large, pregnant women who become sick with COVID, end up in hospital, have a high risk of severe illness and the possibility of death. Okay. So we have arrived at a position where we basically are saying, look, you're better off taking the vaccine than not, because you're going to have protection against severe illness mm -hmm. and the possibility of complications and ultimate demise if you don't take the vaccine. That is where we are at this point in time. Understood. And you spoke a little bit about, basically, at this point, there's no evidence that shows that there's any adverse effects to the mother as well as the fetus. At what point, at this, what point at or stage we are at with the numbers as to these studies that show it does not have adverse effects to mothers and the fetus if you want to be purely scientific and, and and explain it from that point of view most of the knowledge that we have i want to refer to as anecdotal in other words there were people who became sick with covid during pregnancy in the early stages and there was a large series that came out of china and then there were people who got the vaccine who didn't know they were pregnant and you know, we recognize that they went through the pregnancy, they delivered normally, didn't have any complications, and the, the numbers have increased, and so our knowledge base has increased. There are some scientific studies that are ongoing both in the UK and in the US to look at specific aspects of the virus with respect to vaccination versus non-vaccination, pregnancy, non-pregnancy. 
that will ultimately help to fill in the gaps with our knowledge. So we're not trying to make people believe that we have all of the answers because both Dr. Lois and Dr. Walters was explaining where we are at this point in time. Certainly where we are at this point in time isn't where we were a year ago. We are much further on. We know a lot more. We have more scientific data to work with. We know more about variants and what they can do. And Dr. Lois is very you know, clear and inexplainable. You know, suppose we have had the Delta virus, Delta variant in the BBI with all that is going on, et cetera, et cetera. So our knowledge base continue to evolve. And that is what we want people to understand that we're not, you know, we're not going to force people into taking the vaccine. I had a very interesting discussion with one of my patients yesterday, for instance, about the vaccine. And uh, she's not pregnant. She's planning to get pregnant and she was asking me. And I said to her, professionally, I think you should take the vaccine because I'm fairly confident that it's not going to cause you any problem. But personally, you shouldn't take the vaccine until you are comfortable that it is what you want to do. And that is something that we are trying our best to get people to understand. We are not trying to force anybody to take the vaccine. It is a personal decision. We're encouraging people to take the vaccine because of the knowledge that we have at this point that we know that a vaccine can prevent you from becoming severely ill, and we want you to prevent that. And that's what we're encouraging the persons to do. Thank you very much. Dr. Walters, now we have a question from a resident. And they're asking if, does the vaccine adversely react to any medication persons are taking? So is there any research that shows that any medication might have an adverse um, effect with the COVID-19 vaccine? There, there aren't a whole lot of medications. One of the things that we did find is that patients who are on immunosuppressive drugs, so like patients who have autoimmune conditions, cancers, and getting either chemotherapy or um, immunosuppressive stuff for things like even lupus, that because those are suppressing your immune system, when you actually get the vaccine, your body does not mount the amount of um, immune response that you want it to do. And as a, as a matter of fact, those patients, they're now recommended that they get a third shot because it takes that many times for their body to actually mount the response that they need in order to be able to fight off um, that COVID infection if they happen to get it. So it kind of lessens the effect of the vaccine itself, but for a medication, like your regular medications that you take for your diabetes or your high blood pressure or your heart disease, there is no contraindication to the um, vaccine. And, and I think we're looking at vaccines like medications and technology and mm -hmm. things like that. Just remember this vaccine, all it really is, is a part of the virus. Right. So everything that happens in this vaccine will happen a million times more with the COVID virus because we're using a small piece of a protein that looks like part of the COVID virus and we put it in some sugar and we <laughs> inject it in your arm. That is exactly all it is. It is not a medication. It's not like a uh, a chip, a technology, all of that. It's its really just a small piece of a protein that looks like part of the COVID virus and it's injected into your body so your body can recognize it before the actual infection. So those, those contraindications to medications just would not necessarily be there for the vaccine. Understood. Another question we have coming in. So if I don't have any underlying conditions, is it safe to not be vaccinated? Let me take that, because I love it. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I love it. And I had the same Young, discussion. Young, strong, and healthy. I, you know, I had the same discussion. I said, look, I believe at my age, I'm, 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 I'm in good shape. You know, I exercise regularly. I eat properly. I don't do this. I don't do that. And I believe that my body can mount the immune response to fight off this and fight off that. But I'm not taking that chance. I'm not taking that chance because I have a weapon that can fight that for me. It is not safe to have that idea that because you think you're healthy, 
that you shouldn't be vaccinated. In fact, because you're healthy, you should take the vaccine because you're unlikely to have any problems from the vaccine at all. As Dr. Dr. Walters is just explaining what are some of the potential problems in people who have underlying medical conditions. But for you who are healthy, yeah. don't risk it. It is not worth the risk. Take the vaccine. Okay, so I'm gonna do a follow up to this. If I have all the bush medicine in my backyard. Why should I take the vaccine? Shoot, Dr. Lois, I see you smiling. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think I think persons know that I am very much about trying the natural ways to treat diseases. And my area of, you know, my forte is chronic diseases. So I love actually dealing with patients who have things like diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. Um, you know, my postgraduate training is in obesity management. And those are not conditions that you can treat with a bush or you can fix overnight. And so far, yes, listen, even for the regular flu, it takes some time for some of those bush medicines to work. As it is right now, we don't have standardized doses. We don't have standardized, you know, what exactly Bush is supposed to use. Um, book it and sure. If a drug company could have found a compound in one of those bushes to be able to manufacture into a treatment for coronavirus, there would be no hesitation to do just that. Okay. But what we, we have not seen the evidence that anything that comes from a bush is necessarily going to be effective against coronavirus. You all have to remember, this is not just your regular flu. This is not just, you know, um, not even H1N1. This is a bit more dangerous and more deadly than even H1N1 was a few years ago. So we, we can't say, well, you know, I'll just drink my garlic and my, um, you know, my ginger tea. For the most part, even young persons are at risk for developing severe COVID diseases. And I want Dr. Walters to talk about long COVID because she is seeing it. We are going to be seeing it in the BVI because we had a number of young persons who were infected. I've had a few patients who had coronavirus and they told me their experience because they were unvaccinated, unfortunately, and it was not nice. So we're not, we're going to start seeing long COVID and we have to understand that so far, yes, nobody's telling you don't drink your bush and don't drink the garlic tea and the ginger. But you know what we want? We want to ensure that the effect of coronavirus on your body is so weakened by the effectiveness of the vaccine that that's all we need. That, that, I would love to see what a vaccinated person, you stay home, you drink your ginger, you drink your garlic, you get your warm, you do your steaming, and you'd be able to safely be able to do those things if you have the extra protection from the vaccine on board. What we don't want is for persons to remain unvaccinated and then having this high risk of ending up going to the hospital. Because we know that our hospital is very small. We're not able to handle a lot, you know, coming in all at one time. And I heard Dr. Elson Van de Poel yesterday talking about their experience right now in the emergency room. And because I've worked in the emergency room here, I felt like I was there with him as he was describing seeing patients coming in breathless gasping for air dying multiple patients dying on a shift nurses having to go and find a corner to go and cry this is not the situation that we want in our small community especially among people who are family who are friends who are work colleagues this is not what we want in our society and this is why we the physicians are encouraging all of us to get on board with the protect one another initiative because that's really what we're doing i myself I'm fairly young. I eat healthy. I exercise. I, I mean, I post this all the time because this is really the life I am about. I have a small child. My house is fairly young. We'll, we will fare pretty well. Right. But I come into contact with a lot of older patients. Like I said, I love dealing with chronic diseases. And a lot of my patients would be the more vulnerable category of society to this coronavirus. I could not risk them then coming into contact with coronavirus through me. That would literally tear my heart out to know that somebody would have gotten it from me. So if, even though I want to protect myself and my selfish reason, I'm not going to lie, we, we're being honest here. My selfish reason was because I want to travel and I want the world to open back up and I want us to get back to a more regular way of life. I want schools to open. Mm -hmm. You know, those are my selfish reasons, but my altruistic reasons, because I am part of a society. I deal with patients that 
I have to think about their best interest. So for all of these reasons, I took a vaccine on day two of the rollout here. Okay, more questions are rolling in. Now, someone is asking, how soon after recovering from COVID-19 can you take the vaccine? The UK guidelines say 28 days after your initial positive re result. I don't know if that's different for the mRNA vaccines, Dr. Walters. Maybe you can speak about that. Well, it, I don't think it's necessarily vaccine related. I think it's just in the um, environment we're in. So in the U.S. right now, there the only indication to wait is if you were immunosuppressed or if you got a treatment with like the monoclonal antibodies that we have mm -hmm. that we test. Um, in those cases, you have to wait 90 days. Other than that, really and truly, we, we give the vaccine as soon as you're out of the acute period and you're not having any symptoms. So you can get that first shot within that first month. But the U.K. guidelines just say 28 days after. Okay, mm -hmm. and Dr. Walter, someone is asking um, about the safety of the mRNA being it the first of its kind. I'm not sure if it is the first of its kind, but is it the first of its kind? And can you speak to the safety of okay. it? So I always tell people this is like my science geek out moment because I love the <laughs> mRNA vaccine um, technology. This is not new. So they have been doing mRNA vaccines for like, you know, I don't know if you guys remember when Ebola came out, I think it was around 2014 and everyone was gripped. Yeah. Around that time, they were developing an mRNA vaccine for Ebola, but it never actually became a pandemic or anything like that. The original SARS um, outbreak in China in 2012 was also the time that they decided, hey, we have this mRNA technology that we know about now. This is a great time to use it for a vaccine. Again, SARS went away before they were able to develop it. But mRNA technology is used all the time. We're, we're starting to use it for like chemotherapy drugs. They're using it for other um, treatments overall because like, like we said, we're getting technologically advanced. Okay. We have DNA typing. You can go on Ancestry.com and find out if your kid is going to have blue eyes. So, <laughs> so we have been able to do all of this. And as a result of that, we have all of this science that is improving and we can have more targeted treatment. So that's why I always say I'm geeked out about the mRNA technology because it's a pure, like, focused, like, pointed um, response to an exact um, vaccine um, or a virus. So they're able to say, this is the DNA sequence of this virus. We're going to make an mRNA sequence to a protein, have your body just take that message and make the protein itself. So you're not using any viral particles. You're not using anything else. You're just using the machinery that God made in your body to do this and so it's also easier when we need boosters and we have to change this vaccine that it can be done like that because it's just when you look at your DNA sequences, there are letters, D's and A's and, and all of those things put together. And because we are so great when it's come to DNA and pointed technology in terms of treatments, we are able to use this and say, hey, let's make this vaccine. So I, like I said, once I found out about the science, I was first in line because I'm like, I am about to get this amazing vaccine that's going to change the way vaccines are being made, like even when we have any other pandemics or any other infectious um, outbreaks. Okay. So, so, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you out though, Dr. Walters. Was that okay. really what made you want to go and get the vaccine? Tell well, them actually, what really made you want to go I'm going to be completely <laughs> honest. It was part of the reason, but initially, and just like Dr. Lewis said, me and my co-workers were like, we're healthy, we're likely to do fine, let's just get it, get our natural immunity, get it over with, and we don't have to be so careful. Until I started seeing people with post-COVID symptoms. <laughs> and until I found out that the natural immunity doesn't last. And I was like, there is no way I am wanting this infection at all. And so okay. that that and my and my patients were actually my number one reason. Okay, yeah. this is the second time that long COVID and post COVID came up, and I think 
the viewers and the listeners are like, what are they talking about? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, Dr. Walters, you work in a post-COVID um, clinic. Let's talk a little bit about what is post-COVID or what some people call long COVID. Okay. So what we had started to see probably last summer, so I was initially seeing patients with COVID and a lot of them were employees at our hospital. What we started to see is that we had these patients that would come in with these weird constellation of symptoms. Their infection is finished. It's gone. They're no longer contagious. Even some of them have negative tests. Um, but they were still having these long-term symptoms, weird symptoms. And they would go to their regular doctor, they would go to their cardiologist, they would go to their pulmonologist, their lung doctors, their neurologists, and they would do all this imaging and testing and be like, none's wrong with you. The majority of my patients at the beginning were being told it's all in your head, or you have anxiety, or you have PTSD, here is some anxiety medicines, here is some depression medicines, you'll get over it. And... I realized there was something going on when they started to all say the same thing. And I'm like, they did not have a conversation before they came to the clinic with these symptoms. So what we find out, have found out is that after COVID, there is another syndrome that doesn't go away. About one third of patients who've gotten COVID, and these are not just people who have underlying conditions and were in the hospital and super sick. The majority of my patients are within the age range of 25 to 50, healthy previously, marathon runners, lawyers, doctors, and they now have these constellation of symptoms that most of them can't even get back to work. They can't get back to what they were previously because the damage that was done during that acute infection has now progressed and lasted a lot longer. So you hear long COVID and post COVID and you hear post acute COVID and long haulers and all of these. So right now, because it's still a regular, uh, relatively new syndrome, there is no consensus as to exactly what it is, but usually the post acute COVID is within the first uh, three months or 12 weeks after your infection and any symptoms that progress after that, that's what they call the long haulers or the long COVID, and these are people that can have symptoms up to a year or more after their, their acute infection. And I will tell you that the symptoms are very debilitating. I have patients cry in my office and beg me not to get COVID because of how um, debilitating these symptoms are. One of the most, the major ones is a persistent fatigue. You actually just do not have the energy to even get up out of bed or have a shower. It just drains your body so much that you can't run with your kids. If you are a runner, you can't do it. By trying to do any activity, you get extremely fatigued. You have extreme shortness of breath. Your heart is racing. Um, another common symptom is what people call brain fog. And so this is kind of memory deficits. These are people who are accountants and cannot, it takes them an hour to do their job that took five minutes. They have short term memory loss. So they can't remember what they say five minutes ago and they're constantly repeating themselves. Um, we have people who have increased anxiety, increased depression, insomnia. Those are very, very common things that, that they all have and struggle with and honestly, there right now we have no medications or no things that is like, this is going to work for this, especially that fatigue. It is probably one of the worst things that the patients talk about is just not being able to go back to their regular activities. And, you know, they would say, oh, well, this is just someone that's complaining. But I have seen people that I know as coworkers who are like type A personality that cried, um, I've seen lawyers, I've seen people who are losing their businesses because they're, they work for themselves and they can't do it. I've seen people who are on disability now because the job said, I'm sorry, if you can't come back tomorrow, we can't hire you or we can't keep your spot. And so on top of everything else, they're having that pressure, that financial pressure of how do I support my family now? How do I support my kids? How do I get food on top of everything else that's going on? I actually had one patient 
who Department of Children's Services was about to come and take her kids because she was pregnant when she had COVID, was on a mechanical ventilator for months, actually did, took her baby during her, her while she was intubated. She, she was not there for her own baby's delivery. But she was so fatigued that her older kids sometimes had to help her with the younger ones. And then they would go to school tired and be asleep. And this happened consistently to the point where the teacher said, if you don't do something about your kids sleeping in school, we're going to have to call the Department of Children's Services to take your kids away. So the, this is not... This is not, uh, oh, I just feel a little tired. These, this is life-changing symptoms that a lot of these patients actually have. Well, after that explanation and that just, you know, if someone still says that this is just a bad cold, I, I really don't know what to say because that just sounds like a lot. But we must move on because the questions are rolling in and we're very happy that persons are in, engaged in asking questions. If you have questions, please send them forth. Um, if you're joining us, join us on the Leader of the Opposition page on Facebook, and you can submit your questions there. But another question that we have, and Dr. Pickering, we want you to chime in here. Now, what if someone took his or her first vaccine and two days later realized they had COVID-19? Do they need to take it over? what would be the impact on this person? The vaccine, you mean? Yes, so they, the took the so they took the vaccine, their first dose mm -hmm. of the vaccine, and then they realized that they had COVID. Um, so they maybe had COVID when they got the vaccine. So they're worried about, will there be any impact and do they need to take the COVID-19 vaccine over? Yeah, they'll have to take it over because the immunity does not develop immediately. It takes a minimum of two weeks before your body starts producing enough antibodies to have any impact. So they will have to take it over if they're going to benefit from taking the vaccine. Um, and it will be difficult to predict what may or may not happen moving forward. It's a good question from the context that it just shows the variety of issues that persons have. And that's why it's so important to have conversations mm -hmm. with your physicians, with even people who you, you think might have better understanding than yourself, that you'll be able to individualize it and know what's best for you ultimately. But that particular person will have to take over the vaccine. Okay. Now we have one for you, especially Dr. Lewis. Um, with you being a mom, um, what is your thought on vaccine being made available for kids? If they're available yet, um, and what are your thoughts when this do come on stream? So we, I think the government did announce that they're going to be um, kind of first first priority is going to be to vaccinate our children that are over the age of 12. The AstraZeneca vaccine right now is not approved for persons under the age of 18. So I have actually had quite a few parents reaching out to me whose child might be 17, but turning 18 later on, and they want to know if they should wait or if they should try and get the mRNA vaccine. Again, I think it's a matter of a risk and benefit. Um, when we were thinking that we had the um, Delta variant here, I remember Dr. George is saying that we no longer need 70% of the adult population. We need 80% of everybody being vaccinated to give us what we call herd immunity or enough vaccinated persons to create a wall of protection around maybe the 20% of persons who either choose not to, cannot, or just simply will not. Um, take the vaccine. And to do that, we're going to have to consider vaccinating our children. Now, when you look at the statistics, statistically, children do not suffer from coronavirus the same way an adult would. And they do not, you don't see as much illness in children, but our children are part of our society. 
And so we can't deny that, yes, a few of them may get sick, may get seriously ill because there is a multisystemic um, syndrome that happens in children. And then you also have to consider that we in the Caribbean, we very often live in multi-generational homes, meaning that we would have not just parents and child, but we'd have grandparents, great grandparents, everybody living under the same roof. And, you know, you really want to protect especially older, more vulnerable persons in the home from even coming into contact with coronavirus. And one of the best ways to do that would be vaccination. Now, my son, my younger son is six. So he is not in the age group where he would be considered for vaccination. But my older son is 21. And my older son did take the um, COVAX vaccine, which is very, which is the same um, as the AstraZeneca vaccine, basically. Um, my parents who are, you know, in their 70s, or just my dad is just about to turn 70. My mom already did. They took the vaccine. My sisters who are in their 30s, they took the vaccine. My son and his girlfriend, who are both 21, they took the vaccine. And my niece who's 19, she took it. Now, for us, considering what is going on in the BVI and, you know, we, we want to be able to have schools opening, I really do think, and this is just my personal, you know, influence, my professional opinion, I think we do need to ask our teachers to really consider getting vaccinated because when you look at the grand scheme of things, our teachers will be the ones who will be more vulnerable. We do have quite a lot of te teachers who have underlying conditions like hypertension and diabetes as well. And so they definitely fall into the more vulnerable category of, you know, persons, if they come into contact with coronavirus, they will suffer more. And then, yes, I think individually, a family needs to make a decision about whether they want to have their child who is over the age of 12 vaccinated. I think that we can all agree as medical professionals, it would be beneficial to have all of our children who can, who qualify to have it done to be vaccinated as well. Um, but I do think it's a matter of looking at the risk. If my son, the younger one, were over 12, would I consider vaccinating him? I would, because I work in a medical professional. And, you know, my son, as opposed to another child whose, you know, parent may have nothing to do with being frontline worker, being in the service industry, you know, who's not at risk. My son would be more at risk because I am, a, I would be more at risk of coming into contact with coronavirus. So I, I would consider vaccinating him, but I think that's definitely a decision that a parent needs to make um, in conjunction with their child. Cause I know in the States, certain, you know, even friend circles, the parents may want all the children to be vaccinated so that the kids can play unvaccinated together. So, you know, it, it's both a community um, discussion. It's a personal discussion. It's really, as we keep saying, a discussion about risk and benefits of vaccination. Okay, thank you. Now, well, um, um, yeah. Colonel, let me, let me jump in there because there's another aspect to this question that I've been asked uh, a number of times. And it pertains specifically to teenage girls. Should they be given the vaccine? I've had a number of parents who have asked me that question because there are a number of reports of women, especially younger women, having menstrual problems of one form or another when they've taken the vaccine. And it is a very difficult question to answer at this point in time. Very specific, the question is, my daughter's 14, my daughter's 17, my daughter's 16. Should I consider giving her the vaccine? And the same principles that Dr. Lois just explained apply. There has to be a discussion about the pros and cons about it. But because there's this circulating amount of information that it causes these menstrual problems and the parents are concerned well, how is it going to affect my child when she grows up? Is it going to affect her? You know, is she going to have long-term problems? How is it going to affect her fertility issues, et cetera, et cetera? What I, also, what I do inform parents is that if you're concerned, you can wait because there are some multicenter trials that are going on now that will help us to be able to understand and answer that question in the next couple of months we're hoping by the end of the year, we'll have enough information and enough data to be able to answer that question specifically with respect to the administration of the vaccine to teenage girls, young females. Very difficult question. And I'm 
has to be individualized. But if you're really concerned and you don't want it to, to, to take the vaccine, I'd say just wait until we get some more data, which we should have hopefully by, by the end of this year. Thank you so much, Dr. Parker, for jumping in with that because it really shows that it's a conversation for everyone. Everyone has their concerns. Everyone has questions. And it's just such a wide topic. Now, we spoke a whole lot about vaccines, but persons are interested to know about alternative treatments. What, what, is, what is your um, thoughts on this, doctors? We're going to start with Dr. Walters. So in terms of alternative treatments, treatment is the, is the word that you have to think about. And I always say this all the time because I remember hearing this when I was growing up. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So when we're looking at preventative stuff in the, the alternatives that we're talking about are not things that are necessarily going to prevent you from getting sick for covid or um, prevent you from ending up in the hospital. What we're talking about a lot is treatments. Once you get the infection, what we can do. And of course, those include, you know, the, the bush teas that people have been talking about, but recognize that once that infection gets into your body, you are now playing Russian roulette. You do not know how your body, because we don't walk around saying, well, I know my immune system is like this because we don't test it. And there's no thing for us to know whether your immune system is going to be underactive, overactive, working well or not. And not because you're healthy and you take your, your vitamins and wellness, those help, but you still do not know because healthy, normal people who do all of that have still died from COVID. Mm -hmm. So we want to try and focus as much as possible to prevent having this infection. But there are a couple of things that, you know, we have used. We have used a vitamin C, we have used the vitamin D, we have used zinc um, supplementation. Those are things that they're not only helping the immune system, they're helping to repair it. And so we know that it's in the fight of its life with this, with this virus. And so those medications try to help speed up the repair so it can do its job very well. Okay. Um, those medications, again, I love that we come up with these that help their immune system, but they are probably a whole more effective if we're taking them a lot sooner than when you actually have COVID. Um, so those are some of the medications and we give them to our patients as well. Hey, it's, in the dosages that we give, it's not going to cause harm. We know it can help repair the system. Let's go ahead and give those medications to them. There are other drugs that, you know, through throughout we've been trying and trying to figure out if they work. Hydroxychloroquine was a big thing to the point where people with lupus couldn't even get it because everyone hoarded it and it didn't prevent worsening of infections. Um, I know in the Caribbean, a big thing is ivermectin and Charlotte might want to talk about it um, there. But again, the jury is still out because we don't have good studies that show that ivermectin is going to prevent you or treat it. Now, I'm not saying that it may not have helped someone, one or two people, three, four, five. You might know someone who said they took it. But I guarantee for every person that you said took something mm -hmm. and got better, I know someone who took it and did it. <laughs> um, and I have, I've had patients that have done that, have done, you know, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, everything they could think of to try to improve their symptoms. And they still end up with post-COVID or a prolonged course of illness. Mm -hmm. so, so we have these things. We have these things. And I say, if it's not going to harm you, definitely I'm not against you trying it. But us understand that once you have that infection, the majority of what goes in is left to chance on what happens with you. And none of those things are, are um, antivirals to get rid of the virus. It's your body's immune system that's doing it all. There is no medication that's going to get rid of that virus. Your body does that. Okay. Okay. Now, we have someone who just wants a quick confirmation. Earlier, we were speaking about um, that response between getting COVID and then taking the vaccine afterwards. So the person wants to ensure, is this 28 days after your negative test? Or is it 28 days of catching COVID? 
28 days from your first positive test result. Okay, and just to um, kind of piggyback on what Dr. Pickering was, was talking about, um, what, he was, what he was describing, if you have come into contact with COVID and then you take the vaccine unknowing, unbeknownst to you, um, I, ha I actually have tried to look for some evidence and some studies that would show what the effect would be of that person who may have been infected previously, didn't know, and then took the, vi the vaccine. And I haven't really found anything. But I think if the other doctors want to chime in, I think best um, educated guess would be that because the vaccine works differently from your body's natural immune response, that you're going to have a better long term and more strategic response to your infection as opposed to if your body was trying to do it on its own. Okay. Remember what we keep saying is that the vaccine allows your body to recognize it and to have a more strategic response. Um, but if you already have the infection, you're going to have the more acute or the more immediate um, you know, fighting response to happen. And, but while that is happening, between your vaccine and somewhat your natural immunity are going to help to build up the more long-term and the more strategic response. I don't know if the other doctors would, can, can say we can agree on that for the most part. And I yeah. think as we go along, evidence will continue to come um, and that will be able to tell us for sure. And then okay. the other part of that too is, you know, you're, you're COVID positive around the vaccine, your natural immunity for, for antibodies and the COVID vaccine takes two weeks. That's the time that you have your acute infection. So by the time that mm -hmm. acute infection is gone, that's when your immunity is building up. So whether it's going to interact with that infection right then and there, um, it's going to be your immediate immunity response to so the fevers, the chills, those things that you get that make you sick, that are the immediate. And those are the bombs that Dr. Lewis talks about, <laughs> the snipers. So those are the bombs that kind of injure everything. And then the snipers come later. Understood. Now, Dr. Pickering, we have a question for you. And we're kind of now, we spoke about the vaccine. We spoke about a number of things. But now, as we're starting to wrap up, we want to really zone in on the BVI and what is happening in the BVI. Now, we had a question. And one resident asked, now, the BVI have seen, we've seen 1,600 plus cases in over maybe two to three weeks of a span. Now, some persons are saying it's due to the borders opening and unvaccinated persons coming in without testing. Some persons are saying we got a little slack, we were having parties, we were having fun. And, you know, some persons are just saying altogether that we just neglected COVID-19 vaccine protocols. And then some are saying that we just have a low vaccination participation. There's so much narratives going on and out there. Now, what would we, what would the doctors say uh, could have contributed to this wide outbreak that we're seeing, that we saw um, about two weeks ago in the BVI? We could start with Dr. Pickering. You know, and, and all the postulates are probably correct. They're, they're probably all additive rather than one or the other. I don't think that there's necessary, you know, one thing or another. If there was one thing to be identified, I think it would be that we definitely had a super spreader event. That I think is what, that, what got us, there was some event or events that could be defined quote unquote as super spreader. And, you know, that's like the horse leaving the band. And once the horse left the band, there was nothing much you could do to pull it back in. That's why some 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 persons who asked the question about should we go on another lockdown um, or not. Well, a lock the lockdown initially was to keep the virus out. Once the virus is out, there's nothing to lock out. Once you have, you know, the terminology is community spread. Once you've had community spread, you know, the house has left the ban. So whatever the postulates are for reason or reasons why we end up where we ended up no no i think the most important that we definitely had a super spreader event and it, it, the, the virus just ran rampant after that and um, that's what under the bridge now yeah i think it's important for us to i have you know identify these things because you just don't want it to happen again now someone is asking 
The PCR test, how do we know if there has been false positives or po false negatives now, currently, or even in the past? Dr. Lewis? Every test. So I, I've actually worked in a lab a few times in my life. Um, so we know, and, and having studied medicine, we know that every test has a failure rate. Uh, what, why something is considered a gold standard test is because it would have a high level of accuracy and a high level of sensitivity. So the PCR test, you know, is something that is extremely sensitive and extremely specific for the coronavirus. So that is why it's even better than an antigen test. Um, we, we, you know, we can get into the differences in the test, but really and truly a PCR is considered gold standard because it can pick up in your body as little as 10 coronavirus particles. So, and that is not enough to cause an infection, mind you. So I personally know that I have had to call um, public health to ask some of clients of mine who may have tested positive and, you know, to find, to, you figure out the next steps for that person and uh, they would be able to look at the results from the PCR and they can see what that person's viral load or how much they actually found in the sample that was taken from the person to determine if that person is not, not really negative or positive, but if they're transmissible, because remember, you know, even unvaccinated persons, you're going to come into contact with coronavirus because we have community spread. The difference is, are you going to have enough found, especially in the nasal passages, to be able to spread it to other persons? So once you reach a certain threshold, that is when we consider you're, yes, you're positive or you're negative. Okay. But it doesn't mean that you're absolutely absent of having any coronaviruses, you know, particles at all. What we're really looking for is how much can you actually spread to other persons? So the PCR test, it could be for a number of reasons that you can have false negatives or even false positives, but false negatives can also come about because the person may have tested too early. And that's why it's very important for people to kind of keep a track on when symptoms, for example, may have started, or even to think back when they may have, you know, been around a certain somebody who didn't quite look like they were well. Like those sort of things are very important because we know there's a timeline with infections from it coming into your body and being able to reproduce itself so much that it's now going to be detectable. And if you do it too early, then you can miss it and you can think that the person is negative, but the person is having all the coronavirus symptoms. And so if you retest the person, it's like, well, how do I test negative or now I test them positive? And it has a lot to do with how much we're actually able to pick up. The, but the PCR, mind you, is very, very sensitive. So it's not necessarily that it's, it's not finding it or that, you know, there are also levels and, and thresholds that you have to bear in mind. So it's not exactly a cut and dry sort of, um, sort of scenario and answer. Okay, thank you. Right before we close out and we want, you know, closing remarks from all three of you, just quickly, I want someone to speak about just next steps. God forbid someone does catch COVID. What do you advise them to do? What is their next steps? What are things to look out for? Just some advice on how to deal with it right away. I think overall, um, monitoring your, your symptoms is, is probably the most crucial thing. And so things that I recommend to patients all the time is if you're able to get, and I know this might be hard to get at home, but if you're able to get one of those um, pulse oximeters that look at your oxygen level from your finger, if you're able to get one of those, definitely get it. Um, you want to ensure that you're not putting others at risk. So the first thing is making sure you're isolating from people. It's hard, like, you know, if you live in the house, you can't, sometimes you can't just leave the house but making sure that you're doing as much as possible to keep others in the house safe. If they're around you, making sure they're wearing masks at the time or gloves, that you're staying in one room, that you're not using um, kitchenware that others are using, that you're not washing your clothes every day because you're exposing them to it, that you take your clothes and you wash it maybe once a week and keep it in your room and that you try to limit that exposure back and forth. So that's the first thing is not making anyone else sick. The second thing is being very, very attuned to your body, understanding when things are changing. Like if you're, if you're starting to lose vision, that is not a good sign. If you're starting to cough up blood, that is not a good sign. That is not the time that you say, 
hey, I'm going to write it out because I've seen patients, um, just even a personal experience, my assistant pastor, he was not having symptoms. His wife was had COVID, was worried about her, but he had that pulse ox. And he noticed when his oxygen started to dip in the 80s. And he walked to the EMS, says, I'm fine, got to the hospital. He was in the hospital for two months, intubated for 42 days because, but he, he was able to come out because early detection, early detection is the easiest or the fastest thing you need to do. Other things we recommend, if you can lay on your stomach, that prone position helps kind of recruit the lungs so that they're able to hold more air and you don't end up with things like that. Um, symptoms, basically when you're in outside of the hospital, it's all symptoms, it's treating your symptoms. But it's important to have a good relationship with a provider, with your physician, and have someone that you can call and say, hey, doc, um, I'm starting to have these symptoms. Um, is this worrisome? Is this something I need to go in for? Is this something that I can treat? And then that person who has this experience can tell you, uh-oh, that sounds like you're getting where your oxygen level is low and those types of things you need to come in early. We want early detection and be seen early rather than say, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna let it go. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. And by the time you get to the hospital, you're huffing and puffing. And by that time, the damage is done and, and you end up dying sooner rather than later. Understood. Thank you. Now, another question is, and Dr. Pickering can answer this. Should vaccinated persons still wear their mask? and follow other COVID-19 protocols? Oh, absolutely. No question about that. I think it is nothing as you're beginning to, to, just the news has been dominated over the last two days by the CDC guidelines that vaccinated persons should be wearing masks indoors. Um, I think, you know, that in the BVI, we should probably take a little pattern on back for that because I think people by and large are still wearing their masks still paying attention to those those protocols. And um, I'm fully vaccinated and not only do I wear a mask, I double mask. Once I'm out, you know, in my office, I double mask. If I'm in the hospital, I double mask. Once I'm having to interact with persons, I wear double mask. And I, as I told one of the patients yesterday, I double mask not to protect me, but it's to protect you because I'm vaccinated. The chances that if I'm exposed to the virus, I may be totally asymptomatic. I don't even know I'm carrying it. And I can pass it on to you who are not vaccinated. So the masks, oh, absolutely must continue to wear the mask. And I think we'll be wearing masks for a long time to come. Mm -hmm. Another question is, when we're wrapping up now, and I think this is a very important question. I want each and every one of you to answer. Why or why not to take the COVID-19 vaccine? A short, quick piece why or why not? I think uh, I can say that you should take the coronavirus vaccine um, to protect yourself, to protect those around you, to protect um, the community, and ultimately to help protect our very fragile Caribbean life economy. For me, I definitely think you should take the vaccine because one, I don't want to see you die when it's something that we can prevent. Um, I want us to be able to have some semblance of normalcy, whatever that is going to pan out to be. And I don't want anyone to have the debilitating symptoms that you can have from something is preventable. Let's make COVID-19 Something like the flu, where you can get it and you can finally say, oh, it's just like the flu. You may not, or a common cold, you might get it and you might be fine and we're not so worried about it. We're not there yet, but we could be with vaccination. Dr. Pickering? Well, you know, I, I've been a proponent of the vaccine from the very inception and I continue to be, you know, a proponent for it. Um, I just have to endorse what my, my colleagues are both saying, that, that there's no need to get sick from COVID. I mean, we have we have a weapon against it. The weapon is the vaccine. And I think at this stage now, even if you have had concerns about the vaccine, 
look how many people have taken it and 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 they're just going on like nobody's business so whatever concerns about the vaccines that existed i think there's enough evidence walking around in front of us that you could say that the vaccine seems to work mm -hmm. if you had any doubts about the vaccine in the bvi the majority of persons who are unvaccinated are the ones who have become ill and uh, look how many deaths we've had because people were not necessarily vaccinated so i can only beg and plead and, and beg and plead and you know do the best to continue to encourage people you don't have to get sick from covid and you certainly don't have to die from covid because there's a weapon and i want to endorse something that dr walters said and went to great pains and i can only congratulate both of my colleagues for the you know fabulous job they have they've done this evening and i see this thing called long covid it is something that we haven't been exposed to yet but it's something that i just beg and plead people try to avoid getting it and she did a fantastic job of explaining how deep debilitating the long covid can be and i, I congratulate her and dr lois on oh i was i was happy to just sit and listen to both of them you know <laughs> speak on on this subject this evening most definitely um uh, i think that is i think that's some great closing remarks at the end of the day i do want to thank all three of you it was definitely educated like i really i learned a lot from this conversation i really hope that the listening and the viewing audience as well learned as well so dr lewis dr walters and dr pickering thank you so much for joining us today and of course we want to thank the honorable marlon a pen for sponsoring this initiative of course we need to continue to have more conversations like this and of course people persons if you have more questions if this is something you would like to see us do again please let us know because as dr pickering say i think we will be wearing masks for quite some time i think covid-19 will be a topic of discussion unfortunately for quite some time but of course we are just happy to be here to at least give you the information really to be able to on the ground of course i am kyla kinisha and i do want to thank you for joining us and i want to bid you a good evening